sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth to show the way From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky Lift your name on high Lord, I lift your name on high Lord, I love to sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on our socks off. In Jesus' name, amen.
There. Whew. It's hot. I feel like I'm in Florida. And I don't want, no, I don't wish I was in Florida. The temperature's going up down there. And I'm, uh, I'm quite happy in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And uh, it's just like, wow. So here we are, Wednesday night, doing the series, Beware the Snare. Oh, there's my glasses. It's, uh, it's kind of funny because uh, I've been spending a lot of time in my office and I'm uh, just studying a lot of stuff for the start of New Year's. And uh, as I was studying, the Lord says, you got to finish this, this series first. And I said, yes, I understand. So I sat down and I began to listen to him as he gave me really good insight. So let's pray. And then we're going to talk about familiarity. All right. And it, it's kind of interesting because we're seeing a spirit of familiarity creep into um, Christianity today that's that's probably stronger than any spirit that has snuck in all right and uh, the reason I say snuck is because famer- familiarity is one of those things that comes in very subtly and then leaves us kind of in a place where we're just standing there dazed and confused and uh, so it's 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 just one of those things that we really need to be aware of. So Father, we come before you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this message, Lord. Father, we ask that you just open the eyes and ears of our heart, Father, so that we may have an understanding of the word that you are bringing to us, Father. Lord Jesus, just help us to grab it, grasp it, and hold on. Because Father, in in times to come, we are going to need to hold on. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord. We lift this time to you, Father. We give it to you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So what happens when we become familiar with something? Well, let me tell you. In familiarity, I can't grab the depth, the length, or the height, or the width of the importance of what is being deployed in the content of the subject. It's kind of interesting when I looked all that up. And uh, I was saying, Lord, I said, what does de- how does deploy fit into this? And he said, the w- and, you know, so I looked it up. He said, look it up. So the, the word for deployed is mashach, mashach. And it means to draw from. See, God's word gives us everything we need to draw from it, the things to keep us from the snare. God's word is complete for every moment, every time, every situation, and every circumstance. But see, here's what happens. When, when we become familiar, we don't look at the depth, the length, the, or the height, or the width of what God's word is literally telling us. And so we fall into this trap and this trap is, oh, well, I know what the Word of God says. I'm, I'm familiar with it. Are you familiar with it, or are you just saying, uh, I got enough that I can get by with? See? And, and honestly, in, in our next series, um, Psalm 23 for 2023, we, we go into some of the depth of the things that God has for us. I was studying out today the... The men of Isaacek in First Chronicles. The 200 men and their families that were giving, given amazing discernment of God's word in their time. Now, it's kind of interesting because they were given a gift of understanding. We also can receive that gift of understanding. We can receive it if... We are willing to put everything aside and listen to the fullness in God's voice of the things that he has given us that are going to bring us through the times that we are going to experience. So again, 
in familiarity, I can't grab the depth, the length, the height, the width of the importance of what is being deployed in the content of the subject. And again, the word deploy means uh, is mashak, and it means to draw from, as well as extend to. God extends everything he has to us. It's called a grasp. We have to grasp for it and grab it to get it. But if we're just standing there going, ah, thanks, God, I, I, I got it all. I got, en- I got enough to get by with. I'm all set. That's a familiar spirit saying, oh, look, you don't need this part. This part isn't for you. It's for everybody else. And so in familiarity, what do we do? We grab the the top five things we need to know without going into the width, the depth, the length, or the height of what God is telling us. Now, deploy means what we are given is to be given out. So we're given stuff, all right, and as we're given things, our call is to deploy those things. Now, you know, Patrick's out in the street and he's tonight and he's deploying God's love to folks. See? And he's deploying mercy and grace to them. He's, he's doing exactly what God's word says to do. All right? He's taking care of the less of these. And so he's, he's out there. He understands that he had to grasp this before he could do this. Because Patrick's been here for a while. And he, he said, well, I'm not ready to do this yet. I'm not ready to do this yet. He says, he says, when God has me ready, he'll let me know. And then all of a sudden, God said, it's time. See? We, a lot of times, we become so familiar with things that we don't, again, understand the length of things, the distance it's going to take us, the height of things, how high we have to go up in them, the width of things, which means the coverage area, all right, The depth, which is how deep it's going to go. We just, in a familiar thing, go, well, this is good enough. I'm all set. I'm I'm good. When we aren't good. See? So again, in familiarity, we don't see the importance, again, which, as we've said many, many times before, which is the eternal purpose and what we are being given to be given. And so in familiarity, it's like this. Pray for these people. You know, a lot of times I'll get people saying, well, you've got to pray for this and you've got to pray for that. And not once do I hear, you've got to pray that somebody comes and gives them the word of God so they can receive Christ. Because you know what? That should be the first thing. That should be the first thing. Is, again, the word of God says, Jesus came to save the lost. And in saving the lost, that should be the first thing we, we set ground for is, have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? That should be the first thing. We need to pray that somehow somebody comes before these people that are getting ready to go somewhere. We don't know yet because, again, Christ hasn't been brought up, in, brought up to them. We need to bring Christ to them so that they can have an opportunity to choose Jesus Christ. See? Familiarity says, oh, we'll just pray for him and uh, that'll be it. But no, we have to pray in specifics. I've said this before. I pray boldly. I go before God and most people go, I don't know how he gets away with that. But I will pray, I will go before the throne of God boldly. In familiar and familiarity, it's, oh, Lord. Please, just do this for me. Instead of, Lord, you know what needs to happen. And you've got to follow through with your plan for every single person. Because, again, your word says every ear will hear about you. So, Lord, you need to bring somebody that will bring that word to that person. Or open the door so that I can go through and present the gospel of Jesus Christ. That should be the first prayer out of the box. See? But here's familiarity. Here's the, here's the spirit of familiarity. Ah, somebody else will do it. Somebody else will bring the gospel to them. 
You don't need to worry about that. God will take care of it. Well, not if somebody's not praying for that. How many times have we nonchalantly thought that somebody had already heard the salvation message of Jesus Christ? See? Again, God's eternal purpose is that all his children would come to heaven. Are there going to be people in their arrogance and ignorance that say no? Yep, there are. There are. It may be in the presentation. It may be in some things that, uh, from, from soul trauma that are holding them back. But God's plan is that all would hear the message of salvation and receive him. That's the plan. So, another word is a rock, A-R-A-K in the Hebrew, and it means to prepare. Now, it's funny because I was sitting there and the Lord says, not as a prepper. Preparation is something different than being a prepper. Preparation is preparing your life, your heart, your mind, and your soul to receive exactly what God has so that you can prosper in the coming days. Now, again, that doesn't mean money. It means getting ready for the next part of your journey. And I'll tell you what. I, I, I'm, every, in the last three years, it's been an amazing journey. It's been an interesting journey. Sometimes it's been a journey that I just want to go, when does the bus stop and we get off? See? But because I I'm not becoming familiar with God's word and I'm constantly seeking things out. I am prepared for the next part of this incredible journey that God has us on. I have the Holy Spirit comforting me saying, hey, you know what? We got, you got this, got this. Just trust, tr trust the Father, trust the Father. He's going to walk you through this. I'm here for you. You can always speak to me. I'm going to bring the, the, the Father's words to you. You know, you've been saved by Jesus Christ. He's sitting at the right hand of God. Everything's in place. You just need to walk in preparation for what is to come. I loved it that, the, again, I, I can't pronounce the name, the Isachic, I think it is, the Isachic men that were part of David's group in 1 Chronicles. It was amazing. Because these guys knew the direction that Israel was supposed to go in. And they spoke it. They spoke it. And then you know what? When Israel was listening, they were doing fantastic. But when Israel stopped listening, it wasn't working real well. You know, I, I, I've, I had this conversation just the other day. As a nation, we have to figure things out. But as a single person nation, we have to first go before the Lord and repent of personal sin. Then the nation, as a nation of people, has to go before the Lord and repent of the things that it's made a decision to do. Then and only then will God heal the land of the nation. See? And as I was, I was reading some interesting things from some interesting people, and, and it really it really showed where the nation has taken a left turn and gone the wrong way. <sighs> Against God's word. Why? Because, oh, the, the spirit of familiarity says, oh, don't worry about that. Because it's not defined correctly in the word of God. Well, I got to tell you something. Everything in the word of God is divined precisely the way God wanted it defined so that we could live in the direction he has called us to live. Now, what's interesting in 1 Chronicles, it only lists that name once in the group with David. You're going to have to do some studying to find out about these guys and the things they did, which means you're not going to find it in the Bible. You're going to have to go do some history searching in his story. So, again, a rock means to prepare. If what we are to give is out of order, 
it hasn't got the same effect that something in order brings. So if we don't have the perfect order in the, of the perfect plan, and we don't have the perfect provision lined up where it needs to be aligned, then we're giving something that is not going to bring purpose to the conversation. It's going to distract. And in distraction, what are we going to do? We're going to go back to what we know instead of what God has for us in the depth, width, height, and length of, of his word, in the importance of it. And then what's going to happen, we're just going to go back to the same thing. And that's the familiar thing of, oh, as long as I do this, I'm good with God. And that's not what the word of God says. So if it doesn't have the effect that God wants in the order that he brings it, then what happens? We get confused. We get confused. Confusion and difficulty in understanding. The enemy comes in through the spirit of confusion and the spirit of familiarity and we're so distracted that the Lord's sitting there going, wait, this is my word. This is the direction. And we go, but no, that's not it. Who's this voice? See? And so we just keep going back to the old familiar thing of, oh, God just wants me to love. And that's not it. That's not it. And big rats are back. They're not really rats. Listen, if we don't understand what God has, and he will give us this understanding, if we don't understand it in the complexity of God's perfectly ordained plan, then we're not preparing those we are, or are ordained to speak to. Now, somebody's going to say, what do you mean complexity? Well, if you look at God's word, it's like this. Go to the store, buy a 10,000-piece puzzle. Dump it all out on the table. Take away five pieces. Throw them in the trash. Those five pieces have just ruined that puzzle. Because in the complexity of that puzzle, those five pieces are probably the ones that are going to bring the picture of the puzzle to life. And that's what happens. When we lose the complexity and we take the complexity of God's perfect plan out, then the, the perfect plan becomes what? Not so perfect. And then in not so perfectness, what happens? Confusion comes in. What else happens? Oh, now we're, we're, we're stuck in, in chaos and havoc because now we're trying to figure out these pieces, but we haven't gone to the original complexity plan of the plan and tried to figure that out. You know, it's funny because the Bible's a puzzle, and each piece is interwoven precisely with the next piece. And if you lose or take out a piece, then you are losing the content and the context of the picture that God is trying to give you. And how can we take that out and bring it to somebody when we don't have the whole thing, the whole picture, when we don't have the fullness of who God is? <clears throat> Again. Again. And we're not preparing those who are ordained to speak to the, to the ability to handle the will and the way of God's will. If we don't speak it as he has given, then we are not giving the wholeness that brings completeness in God's word. It's funny, he just kept saying that. The wholeness, the fullness of God's word. The word of God, not the word of God. The song goes, I'm complete in him. I'm complete in him. How can I complete, be complete if I only have pieces of it. It can't be. It can't be. See, line upon line. I love that. Line upon line. I have to read line upon line. Stop. Say la. Pause, as, as the Psalms say. Contemplate. Digest. Understand. So that what? I can go into the next line upon line and understand. And I've got to do this through the whole word. Because if I just blister through it and not research and look and study and exegete and, and, and go back into the other things that I need to do to understand the word of God, then I'm just taking the surface word of God. 
and I'm not beginning to understand the complexity of his word. And how can I discern what other people are saying if I don't understand the complexity of the plan of God? I can't. So what do I do? I just become familiar. Oh, I'm just going to become familiar with the word of God. See? I'm just, oh, I'm just going to love, 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 love everything about everybody. Because, see, that's the new familiarity. Just love them all. Love everything about them. Love the sin. Love this. That's not it. That's not it. See, if I just live in that realm of familiarity, then I am not bringing the word of God correctly, which says, first of all, repent. Second of all, receive. See? Third of all, live in the grace and mercy of the reception of Christ as you bring him into your heart as his savior, as your savior. See, if I'm just like, oh, we're just going to love them through all this and let them do whatever they want to do. And what are we doing? We're deepening the sin in their lives by accepting it in familiarity. See? And so what is it doing? It's creating sin block and damage to the blessings and rewards that they would otherwise receive. Oh, there's 800,000 Christians out there somebody's going to bring it. What if it's supposed to be you? What if it's supposed to be you? See? So again, where there's no order, we see confusion. Now, familiar in the Hebrew Strongs mentions the word yedoini and yedo, yo, yed, yedioni, and it refers to familiar spirits. Turn to Isaiah 18 or 8.19. Isaiah 8.19. Thank you, Ray. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm going to start at actually 16. Actually, I think I want to go. Uh, I want to go to verse 12. Yep. Yeah. Don't call for an, ally, an, an alliance like all the rest of this people do. Don't fear what they fear or dread what they did. After all, only the eternal commander of heavenly armies should terrify you. Only God is holy. Only God should leave you trembling. Look what I'm going to do in Zion. The eternal will be for you a sacred place. But for those houses, but for both houses of Israel, I'll also be a stone that blocks their way and a rock that trips them up. For those who live in Jerusalem, I'll be a trap and a snare. Many will stumble over them. They will trip and be broken. They'll succumb to capture and be grabbed up. Now take care. I love this in verse 16. Now take care to keep this message as it is. Don't pick up familiar spirits. Don't let the familiar spirits convince you that oh, you don't need to know this. You already know it. Keep the message as it is. Seal up this teaching and hand it over to my disciples. Did you know that you're all disciples? You're disciples in Christ. So what's, what's, what's Isaiah saying here? The Lord's saying to Isaiah, take care to keep this message as it is, seal up this teaching, and hand it over to my disciples. As for me, I will wait for the eternal, even though he feels absent, even though he has hidden his face from the family of Jacob, I will put all hope in him. You see, I and my children, who the eternal one gave to me, we personify the promise. We are signs of what God intends and will do in Israel. What amazing things the eternal commander of the heavenly armies has in mind. The one who is indeed present in Zion, this heaven on earth. People might tell you to ask. Ready? 
the fortune tellers, consult the babbling astrologers, conjure the dead to tell the living what's to come. But shouldn't they ask God? See? Go to God's teaching and his testimony to guide your thoughts and behaviors. That's a lot right there. Because people are, people are looking for moral character from man. They're looking for morality from a humanistic side. They're going to stargazers and mediums and fortune tellers, people with crystal balls and all the rest of this ridiculous stuff. When God says, don't go to them, because you know what? They're going to bring familiarity. As a matter of fact, familiarity also means going to spirits that are not of God. In other words, these demons only bring in the least of what we need to just get by with. That's what they bring in. The least of what we need to get by. This leads us to yada. Now yada, you've seen that on Seinfeld before, yada, 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 yada. And that's because people can't put a word in there. Now yada means ignorant as well as illiterate. See? And so now, because we're calling on these things and we're allowing these deceptive demons to come in and lead us to the place where we don't need to know the depth, length, height, the width of what God has, we're all set with the surface stuff. And God says that's not right. His word even says go deeper. Go deeper. Now, in Yada, I'm led to perceive, again, perceive is also listed here. I'm, I'm, I'm led to perceive that what I'm hearing is the truth. Except I'm still being held in bondage and I haven't been set free. Which, lead me, which leads me in perception, which leads me into a perception that is not God's, but of a spirit that doesn't want the full counsel of God because it will bring about enormous change in their life. So all of a sudden, I'm sitting there. Oh, I'm all set. Oh, I'm okay. I'm good. Yeah. When the word of God says, again, right here, he just said it. Now take care to keep this message as it is. Seal up this teaching and hand it over to my disciples. See? See? And use God's testimony to guide your thoughts and behavior. If any response disagrees with the word of God, then it's muddling and wrong and not the least bit illuminating. See? I love it because verse 21 says, It leaves the people bedraggled and desperate, drifting here and there. In their hunger, the people are bound to be infuriated and curse their king and God. There's the confusion. There's the chaos. There's the anxiety. There's everything right there. See? <clears throat> now familiarity makes us unaware of the understanding that the fullness of having a spiritual understanding can bring which I find interesting. Because in that understanding and in that fullness, in that full spiritual understanding, it creates a, or having, having an unspiritual understanding creates a I know this attitude. I remember we've had, we've had people say, oh, I don't need to come to Bible studies. I know this. That's a familiar spirit brought on by deception. Because you don't know all of this. I don't even know all of this. And I spend a lot of time in this word. But I don't know all of it. I'm learning constantly. Matter of fact, the word of God says that. You, you won't stop learning until you're home. And so, again, what's Isaiah say? Lock it up. Seal it up. Keep it close. Hand it out to my disciples. That's what he says. Don't go to these strange things. Don't call on different spirits. Don't, don't allow familiar spirits to come in. Don't um, allow the spirit of chaos, havoc, and all these things to come in and confuse you. 
Because in that attitude, a spirit of unteachability, which is shakak in the Hebrew Strong's, and in shakak, instead of increasing, we decrease. We don't increase, we decrease. So if I'm not completely getting into this and I'm not completely understanding God's word and I'm just going, well, then now in my unteachability, because I've got this familiar spirit, <coughs> which again has created chaos, havoc, and confusion, now I'm not increasing because now I'm frustrated, so I'm decreasing. We, we see this so much today as God's word is lessened so as not to offend anyone. We see this all over the land. Oh, we have to, we have to lessen the effect of God's word because if we don't, people will get mad. And we don't want to ruffle their feathers. Because, oh, if we ruffle their feathers, they might throw sticks and stones at us. Sticks and stones will break our bones, but names will never hurt me. And I've been called some doozies. Whatever. Had some sticks and stones thrown at me, but if you learn to shuck and jive, you're okay. Okay. This spirit is called appeasing. And it's called appeasing, folks, because heaven forbid we bring the truth that brings conviction, that brings in a change. See? I, I had to make a phone call this week, and I had to lay it on the line for somebody. And I knew they weren't going to like it. But you know what? I got a call back four hours later. Thanks for doing that. I appreciate it. You know, I was really pissed off at you. I go, yeah, I know. I said, but I had to tell you. Because I love you enough to tell you the truth. Maybe everybody else doesn't, but I do. And I want you to get right with God before something happens. And you're no longer here. But this is what has to happen. And like I said, a few hours later, I get a phone call back. Thank you. I can't appreciate it enough. He says, you do love me enough to tell me the, the, the truth, and it's, it's, it will set me free. And I said, anytime you need to call. Again, how many pastors have grown so familiar that they don't see or understand the deeper things found in passionately preaching God's word in complete content and context? I loved Christmas Eve's message because it, it brought about results. And, and it was kind of interesting because I've never gone that way in, in, on a Christmas Eve message before. I've never taken it that way. But it's only because God said, this is the way I want you to go. And since he's my father and he put his son's life on the line for me, I listen to him. I have to listen to him. And so, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, it was funny because I remember preaching the message once. And a pastor came up to me afterwards and he says, I need you to do that again, but you can't do it that way. And I go, what do you mean I can't do it that way? Oh, that was too hard. And I go, what do you mean it was too hard? <laughs> I said it was exactly the way God wanted it to be. And it was kind of interesting because a, a, a number of people came up afterwards and they went, wow, wow. We needed to hear that. We needed to make some decisions. We needed to be set free from some things. Thank you, for pre thank you for coming up here and preaching God's word the way he called you to preach it. See? I will tell you that God's word did not come to pacify. It came to save. And salvation comes through knowing the truth. Salvation comes through knowing the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. I remember when we first started this church, the Lord had me speak for exactly a year on obedience. And I've said this before. The, the feedback was, <laughs> your message is too tough. 
And I would say, you know what? Don't take it up with me. Take it up with him. It's his message. I'm just up here speaking the words for him. But it's his message. We need to understand this because if you remember the title of this, Beware the Snare. You need to know, you need to know everything you need to know to not be captured by the subtle resistance that the enemy's crew brings in while we're sleeping. Familiarity is a snare. And when it has you, you're trapped. I remember walking through the woods in Waterboro one day, and we saw this area. It was kind of interesting, because about seven and a half feet up, there wasn't a branch or a pine needle on any trees around. And in the middle of this patch of trees was a rope attached to a snare. As we were sitting there looking at it, I went, this is interesting. And I looked down, and there was a leg of a bobcat on the ground. <coughs> that bobcat chewed its leg off to get out of that snare. How come we get caught in a snare, we just hang there and try not to get out of it? Would you chew your leg off to get out of the snare? See? Freedom meant more to that bobcat than hanging upside down by a snare. And so he did what he had to do to become untrapped. See, that's why God says, look, this is why I want my word to be the way that it is. I want you untrapped. And sometimes being untrapped means you've got to make some decisions that you normally would never make. And that's to give up things that you are holding on to. Beware the snare. You don't have to be caught in it. There's always a way to walk around it and prevent it. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this message this evening, Father. Lord, we thank you for your word and the complexity and truth that it brings, at least to our lives, Father, because... Sometimes that complexity and truth makes us cringe a little bit. And I know a few people have cringed this week, Lord. But, Father, I know their cringing has led to redemption. So, Father, I would just ask, Lord, that you would bring these words to such a place in our life, Father, that we see in the reality of, of realness that there's snares all around us, Father. And we have to beware the snare. We have to beware the snare, Father, because, again, the world makes everything look so marvelous and lovely. Maybe there's some people out on Facebook tonight or on YouTube or even in here that have never received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Maybe they've never said, Lord, I don't want to be caught. I don't want to be caught in the things that the world has that are going to destroy me and take me out. So, Father, I, I need to, first of all, I need to come and repent to you. So I need to say to you, Lord Jesus, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me, Jesus. Lord Jesus, take away all the things that I've done, Father, and just throw them into the deepest sea, Father. Forgive me. Give me a clean slate, Lord Jesus. Transform my life. Transform my heart. Transform my mind. Lord Jesus, bring on that new garment and sanctify me, Father, which means reveal your plan to me through your word. Help me to build a rock-solid relationship, Father, with you. Thank you, Jesus. That's a prayer. That's a prayer. Lord Jesus, first of all, forgive me. Lord Jesus, I give my heart to you. Save me. Transform me from who I used to be into who you've called me to be. And then sanctify me. Give me a glimpse of your plan. Work my salvation out through that plan. Now, I don't know if there's anybody watching. I don't even know if there's anybody 
in here. But if that was your prayer, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I keep mine open because I'm a pastor. I would love to have you, if that was your prayer, just lift up your hand real quick and put it back down. And if you're on Facebook, I would love to have you get a hold of me because I would love to pay, pray for you or if you're on YouTube. Anybody say the prayer? Anybody receive Christ? Lord Jesus, we love you. We praise you, Father, and we thank you, Lord Jesus. <clears throat> Father, we just, again, thank you for your word, the truth found in it, the completeness of it, the complexity in it, Father, that brings us to a place where we can be set free. I thank you, Lord. I love you and praise you. In your precious name we pray, Father. Amen and amen.